Okay, so we are actually on Zoom as well, right? Okay, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Maysam Ravazian um, give a talk at EPFL. I know Maysam for a long time now, I think. Uh, um, uh, he is at USC currently before um, he did his master's at uh, Minnesota. Um, there, I think he's done quite a bit of uh, nice work. I still talk to Mingyi about you oh, okay. uh, from time to time. Okay. Um, then he was, um, actually he did a PhD uh, also in Minnesota. Sorry. Yes, yeah, Stan, uh, a postdoc at Stanford. Um, Maysam is actually, um, is a well-recognized uh, uh, person in machine learning, also in signal processing area. Uh, he is the recipient of the NSF Career Award, Northrop Grumman Excellence in Teaching Award, AFOSR Young Investigator Award, and quite a few best paper awards, including Signal Processing Society, um, well, ICCM Best Paper Award in Mathematics. Uh, the list goes on. And, and I, I also did not know that you're a silver medalist in the math Olympiad. Uh, so his research interests include fundamental aspects of uh, optimization algorithms and how they connect to modern uh, data science problems. So um, we welcome Maysam to this CIS slash Lions uh, talk and looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I didn't get through this this way, it seems. <laughs> the list. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. So um, uh, I'm going to talk about a scalable stochastic optimization framework that we have for uh, robust and fair, uh, robust and private fair learning. This is a joint work with my student. My PhD student Tina and I, who went for a postdoc uh, to University of uh, Wisconsin Madison, uh, Devon, who was an undergraduate at IIT Delhi and now is a PhD student at USC, Rakesh, who was at USC and joined the uh, UW, and Ahmad from Google Research. Uh, and at any point during the talk, please feel free to stop me and ask questions. Okay. So the roadmap of the talk would be this. So we start by motivating. I know most of you are familiar with. I'm going to have two slides for motivating fairness and privacy. Okay. And particularly how we need to do fairness through regularization and having a stochastic optimization framework for it. And then we are going to talk about also the need for having robustness and essentially robust fair learning. Let's see some theoretical and some experiments to it during the talk. So let me start by talking about fairness in machine learning. So we all know that fairness is an important consideration that we all have to pay attention to when we train machine learning. If we ignore these uh, requirements, then we may get the unfair models. There have, there have been many uh, incidents uh, such as Google online advertising uh, engine that showed high income jobs more to men than women. There are documented incidences. Uh, there were also ads for arrest records shows up more for searches for distinctively black names. And there are a lot of uh, documented incidences and there could be different reasons for unfair, having an unfair model ranging from historic biases in your data, imbalanced data, or any not correctly processing and collecting the data. It's not only ethical issue, but also it's regulation. Uh, we need to be careful because of regulations. So in US, there are regulations about employment, housing, and education. I'm pretty sure in UU as well, as you can see, UAI Act. Um, in addition to fairness, another consideration that we should, be, we should pay attention to is privacy. So. Privacy is a big concern of most of the people. For example, in US, six out of 10 US adults, they have concerns about privacy in modern age based on recent, uh, uh, recent polls. Uh, and we know that just preventing data breaches is not enough. So 
If you just make sure that your data in some place and no one can attack your data, it's not enough. So there are many examples that if you have access, even if you have access to models, you can uh, violate the privacy of the data used during the training, uh, such as the documented incident and DP2. Uh, in this paper that they show that uh, that they show that if you uh, use an input uh, a prompt for the model, then it may reveal some sensitive data that's been that has been in the training. Also, in the uh, vision task, it's known that if you use model plus individual's name, we can recover some of the training data. And as I said, there are regulation guidelines and uh, regulations and guidelines as well, not only for fairness, for privacy as well. So, so in practice, when you want to deploy a model, we want to have privacy and fairness both at the same time. And that's actually a motivation of this talk. And what I want to do is there are, you can develop different algorithms. What I want to hopefully want to achieve is have modular approach. So if you go through some of the fairness paper, you can see that they require sometimes end-to-end -end changes of the uh, of the pipeline. But some, but if you have something that we can easily implement in some parts of the algorithm of the pipeline training pipeline, that's a very desirable. And one, uh, so so and what we are going to show is do is that. We are going to add a regularizer, simple regularization that can be incorporated into back propagation easily. And, uh, and it will help us, we'll see that it can help us to train private and fair models. Okay. We can also handle situations like this, where your, uh, your, your company wants to train a fair model, but the sensitive attributes are in another data collected organization. So you may not even have a company or organization A may not even have the data. So you have a private communication medium between the two. Or you can have situations like this that multiple companies train the model together. They want to make sure that's fair, but they don't want to share sensitive information. For example, they don't want to share the gender of the people, the race of the people. This, this organization may have it, but the others may not have it. But they want to train something together in short that the train model at the end is private and fair. And so the, the train model at the end is, is, is fair and also private, you have a private communication medium. So none of the players in this training can infer the, the, the data that they are not supposed to know. So they are not going to be inferring the data of this organization, for example. And toward the end, I'll show that you can do some simple tweaks and some uh, changes to make the algorithm actually Robust to distribution shift as well. So, any questions so far? Okay. And uh, for those of you, your company are going to talk about fairness and referring to group fairness. I'm going to define it uh, exactly. And the notion of privacy that we are using oh, is going to be differential privacy. So, how many of you are familiar with group fairness notion? Okay. How many of you are familiar with differential privacy? Okay. All right. So, I'll define it. So let's start with group fairness notions. <clears throat> so there are various group fairness notions. So let's consider a task that you want to predict, let's say a label, you have a true label Y, you have a predicted label Y hat, that's by your model, and you have a sensitive attributes, for example, gender. For example, let's say you train a model to look at the CV or resume of the individuals and see and decide whether you want to interview that person or not. It was actually an incident by an Amazon that they train the model and they figure out that actually the model gives lower score to female applicants than male applicants because of a story. I think it was because of the story bias in their data. I don't know the re exact reason. Uh, so you want to make sure that your model treats different genders similar. So there are different ways and different notions depending on the application. For example, the demographic parity notion essentially says that your sensitive attribute should be statistically independent of your prediction. What it means that in my example, the gender of the individual, whether it's female or male, should be statistically independent of y hat. 
uh, who I had is you whether you say that you want to interview that person or not. There are criticisms of that notion and like depending on applications, you may consider different notions. For example, equality of opportunity, it just makes sure that your these two random variables are independent condition on whether you want to interview that. So condition on advantage group. So, but what is common, and there are many other notions as well, but what is common among many of these notions of fairness is that they require imposing some sort of conditional statistical independence. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about demographic demographic parity notion, okay? There is not condition. So your output, we want it to be kind of independent, statistically independent of your sensitive attribute. But you can redo everything also when you have conditioning. It's just a matter of adding conditioning and all the derivations. <clears throat> and if you know you're familiar with the algorithm design, there are post-processing algorithms, there are pre-processing and in-processing algorithms. Post-processing algorithms, what they do is they take the output and they change it somehow that they make sure that the algorithm is fair. Pre-processing are the ones that they try to remove the bias in the data, okay? So that whatever algorithm you use down the road, then it is fair, your output is fair. And in processing is that you want to change your training mechanism so that the output model, train model is fair. Sometimes like experiments show that the pre-processing and post-processing Typically, you lose more performance because the way that you change the data is not really tailored to that algorithm, particularly pre-processing, because you may need to remove a lot of information. Yes? Why don't we just remove the sensitive attribute from? That's a very good question. So why don't I just remove the gender, for example, from the resume of the individual? So there are incidents that shows that even if you remove it, the model can be unfair because it may learn something that's correlated with that. Uh, Actually, for example, there are studies that shows that if you train something based on the CV of an individual, the model may actually learn the zip code. We use the zip code of an individual, and zip code is correlated, for example, with, with, with ethnicity in the US, okay? Different regions. Same thing for gender. Gender, different high schools, sometimes they're correlated. So it's not just removing that. So if you're just removing it, you may still get biased. And sometimes you have historic bias as well. Sometimes your data, you already have bias in your data. So if you want to remove it, you should be aware of that sensitive attribute. In the extreme case, let me give you in my historic data, if I only have male applicants, like I said, told them that their CV is great, then the model may learn something that's correlated to male and that. So, okay, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. So we are going to focus on in-processing approaches because they, they have less of a performance drop. And particularly many of the methods that they use in processing, they simply add a regularization. So the goal of this regularization is to impose fairness. Okay, you can think of it as this regularization, this R okay. measures, for example, if you want to have demographic parity, that measures how correlated your y hat with s is, okay? But this is some sort of correlation measure, okay? Or statistical dependence measure. And there has been different works for different correlation measures. For example, people use Pearson correlation measure. They use mutual information or maximal correlation in the past. But what is, yes? That's a very good point. So. You may put this as a hard point. Um, so if you can solve it, I'm not aware of any work I'm not aware of, that can handle it for like the, the, the okay, the nonlinear type of uh, regulator, the hard constraints for general loss. The reason is that that typically give you a non-convex constraint, which is much more challenging to handle. Computers, yes. We have, we have some. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm okay. I'm not aware of it. Is it for non-lean non? Okay. Oh okay. So so okay. Not for fairness here. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm not so okay. Let me rephrase it. I'm not aware of any work. I have to look at it. Yeah. 
the, any work that they can do this in the fairness context. And it's a stochastic as well, right? Stochastic constraint and stochastic objective. Okay, so I, I should be. Oh, okay, okay, then I, I have to ask you about it. Okay. So, um, so again, there are different regularizations that has been used for fairness in the literature. Uh, but what we want is that the first thing is that we want to make sure that we capture any type of statistical dependence. For example, Pearson correlation, we know that two random variables could be very like correlated. They could be completely related on each other, but uh, uh, Pearson correlation could be zero. So it just captures linear uh, dependence. We should also have optimization for entity. So we want to have, comp for computational reasons, we want to also consider. And particularly, we want to be amenable to stochastic and batch for back propagation. Because many of the recent models, larger scale, you can't have a huge batch. You can't have 64 event size batches. Sometimes you need to go batch size of four or eight. <clears throat> for, for example, training some of the LLMs or conversational, conversational AI models. And one thing that's important is that, uh, uh, so one thing that's important to pay attention, I'm saying it because I have seen some uh, people some, sometimes feel ignored, is that you cannot use back propagation on anything, okay? Basically, I say that, okay, I, I have back propagation and I take a batch, I have an algorithm, now I take a batch and rerun the algorithm. There is, you want to make sure that the batch that you take or the direction that you take is an unbiased estimator of the gradient. Most of the theories, there are theories for biased estimation of the gradients as well, but they need further consideration and you have to be careful about that. So you want to show, make sure that if you use, for example, certain regularizations such as rho here, which is nonlinear in P, you want to show that if you take the gradient of this with respect to a batch of data, you want to make sure that it's an unbiased estimator of the actual correlation. Uh, and also, so one trick that people use, I'll talk about it, is to they use variational form to get rid of it, but we want to make sure that variational form is optimization friendly as well. Any questions so far? All right. So the part of regularization that we are going to talk about and we are going to introduce and use is exponential rainy mean child information. I'm going to tell you why. So first of all, that's the definition, exponential rating mutual information. If you're not familiar with it, this is the chi-square divergence between the joint distribution of y-hat and s and the product of this. So if this is zero, it means that these two distributions are the same, so you have complete independence. And if it is larger, then you know that. So it's measured somehow, it's a measure of fairness violation okay, on the demographic parity notion. And one good thing about it is that it actually it upper bounds many of other fairness violation measures. So for example, this is this uh, upper bounds that the actual mutual information, it uh, upper bounds the maximal correlation between the two random variables and the LQ distance between the two that's been used also in the literature. So in all of these cases, this row E, which is the one that we have here, upper bounds them. So if you make this one small, the other also correlation measures that's been used and proposed in the literature are going to also be also bound. And one other key observation is that you can you can compute this row e with this formula. So what is this formula? I don't. Uh, what is important in this formula is that this is linear in the probability, so we can have an unbiased estimator of its gradient. This is some or another, like a, a form of a variational form. And another thing that's important is that this is a quadratic optimization value. It's concave and under some mild assumptions, you can assume that it's strongly concave maximization. So we're computing the correlation method between the two random variables. You just need to solve a strongly concave maximization problem, which has close form and which we also have unbiased estimator of this. Just take it back and compute this for a given W as an unbiased estimate. Does that make sense? So if I use this, correlate this reformulation, and plug it in back into this formation. So I have this. Instead of R, I'm going to use this one, this formula. 
If I do this, then I need to solve this optimization problem. So this is a mean max optimization problem. So mean max optimization problems are known that in general they are hard to solve. They are not easy. You may have limit cycles. You may have uh, you may have divergent algorithms. You may have uh, there are uh, there are documents that even the same algorithm if you initialize it changes the seed. 50% of the time, you make a completely different answer. Uh, everything the same, just change the C. It's not as reliable and as a regular minimization. If, for example, in your training GANs, you know that they are unstable. But this is a little bit different. The reason is that your W is, your this side is concave, strongly concave, actually, in W. And it can be shown theoretically that for such problem, actually, the they are much more stable. They are, you're guaranteed, for example, the algorithms that they do gradient descent ascent. They are much, uh, they are guaranteed to converge. You can characterize almost optimal, optimal variance factor iteration complexity. And so essentially you can, uh, you can show that the stochastic gradient descent ascent can solve it. So you do, this is my, I don't, don't want you to, if you are not following all of this, that's fine. What matters is that you do one step of gradient ascent or stochastic gradient ascent over W parameter, and then followed by a step of gradient descent on theta. Okay. And this is in general does not work, but when you have this property that you have a strong concavity, you can show that it can find a station point and it can solve the problem. <clears throat> you can even accelerate it okay, if you want, and uh, you can have the optimal rates. As well, here is the algorithm is not accelerated. So this, yes. It's not convex, yes. So the goal here is to find a stationary solution. So let me. So that's a stationary solution corresponding to the global mean algorithm. Corresponding to, so. So let's call this the max over W. After you take the max over W, let's call this H of theta, just a function of theta. So your goal is to have an algorithm that first of all improves over the iterates. H of theta is decreasing, at least uh, in average. Okay. Secondly, you want to make sure that the point that you're converging, if you stop at some point, for example, the gradient of H of theta is small. For the general mean max problems, these two problems cannot, these two properties cannot be achieved. Meaning that for general mean max problems, if you have non-convexity with respect to theta and non-concavity with respect to W, then the algorithm that you have, it may not be monotone either. So if you start from some point, it doesn't mean that where you stop it, you are getting, there is no guarantee that you are getting better. And there's no guarantee that you stop at the point that the gradient is small. You may get to cycles that they are divergent from your stationarity. But if you have this strong concavity W, this H of theta, which is the maximum or W of this, when you, it's going to, the gradient of it is going to go down. But if I look at it, but I have two guarantees. First is that the algorithm improves over time. And secondly, you get a station point. In certain cases, that the station point is also related to global minimum, such as you have PL conditions, then you can relate these. Two. Or if you have, yes. But there, there are additional things to think around the uh, So you don't assume non smooth, non convexity uh, in the original. I, yes, this is like, I do not have, I do not have that theory. So you need to have Lipschitz smoothness with respect to both sides. Then when you have a strong concavity, this is akin to taking the empirical discrimination and somewhat smoothing it appropriately. Exactly. Right. Um, even when you need solution, you can always get, so you can define the implicit function of uh, theta, which is this maximum form. So the function given in this form. Where whenever you want to compute the gradient, okay, because we're doing optimization with respect to W, you need to take it. Yes. Now, okay. if that gradient is unique, okay, that's, that's something. But uh, you need to eliminate some of the, the technical issues by having reading of uh, pathological cases that would arise when you have non convex and non smooth. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is the analytic algorithm. 
Yes, uh, exactly. Okay, so, uh, yeah, exactly. So the trick, as Volkan said, is that you look at that HF data, and if you think about it, you can, in principle, compute the gradient of HF data, which is you find you use the Dunskin's theorem. You find the maximizer with respect to W and then and the gradient. You can a little bit play with it. You can make the sums work in that in some sense. You can make, like a little bit, you can extend it to that. There is a work for that, Dimitri Dima, uh, that he has uh, work at UTOP. That they, and also this work talks a little bit about it. There's also a little bit where you can relax strong convex cavity a little bit and make it concave assumption. But the trick is again, adding a small regularizer to make it strong and concave and then connect it to. So, but essentially the observation is what we can expect. And since we do one step of gradient ascent, then you need to make sure that you control how much inexactness you in your gradient estimate of HEI. Yeah, yes. No, the gradient with respect to theta of H function. So I call this, after maximizing with respect to W, I call it H of theta. So this function, this function Fermi is a function of theta on W, but the way to analyze it is to analyze this H of theta, which is back max of W. So look at the, this dual function. The way to, like the most of the works that they did, like analysis, they connect somehow, these two. It's not in all works, but in most of the works. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, I, I see you have still some <laughs> doubts. Okay, okay. And uh, one question online uh, from Faith uh, saying that what distribution are you taking expectation over? Oh, this is the data. This, this, this one? Yeah. yeah, this is the data distribution, training data distribution. So this is the training data distribution. We make everything fair with respect to training data so far. I'm going to add a little bit, make it toward the end, talk to how you can modify it to make distribution robust optimization of your version of it. So that if, if the test data is a little bit different than your training data, you still guarantee fairness. And what is interesting here is that the maximization is outside the summation. Yes, that's also a very important point. Yes, yeah, very good point. Yes, that's also a very important point. And maximization is outside. Meaning that if I take the gradient of inside, I have unbiased estimate. It's very good. Any, yes, <laughs> you helped me personally, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Did I answer Saeed's question online? Okay. All right, good. So this is so far everything. Good, so far, so good. I do have another one. I'd like to show you some experiments, but actually this is a paper that we published. A uh, while ago, a couple of years ago, like maybe not a couple of years, maybe one, two years ago. Um, one nice thing about it is that you can also, on top of it, because you have gradient estimates, so on by gradient, you can, on top of it, add differential privacy easily. Okay. So I saw some of you are now familiar with differential privacy notion. So let me briefly uh, define the differential privacy notion. So as I said, just preventing data breaches is not enough. So we can rely on the notion of differential privacy to make sure that the train model at the end of the day is private. So we say a model or a mechanism M in general is differential private. If when you apply M to the data of let's say N users, so I have N users here, apply M, this is your training algorithm, for example, and you get a train model. This M is a randomized algorithm. So you have some randomness. So if I apply this and I get the train model, first train model, and if I apply it to another data set, which is similar to the first data set, except only the last and except only one of the entries is changed. Okay. If you apply M again to that data set, you should still get a model that is essentially almost the same. The output. So meaning that including or excluding any particular individual should not change your output a lot. So if an adversary looks at your train model at the end of the day, they cannot really say whether this individual, this particular data was in your data or not in your data. And mathematically, we need to satisfy this definition. So 
we say that an algorithm is epsilon delta differential private if it satisfies this for any subset for any measurable s subset and any two adjacent data sets x and x prime so this is x this is x prime so if you want to understand it think about it when epsilon is very small so for example when epsilon is zero that says that you have this should be less than or equal to this for any pair of x and x prime because i can switch this as well that implies that you should have equal in the extreme case the probability of observing output is the same no matter what input data you use that's an ultimate privacy if my output is always the same, no matter what data I use, that's all my privacy. No one can look at my output and say what training data I use. So, and one way to uh, enforce differential privacy or impose differential privacy is by add, simply adding noise to gradients. Uh, are you familiar with DPSPD? How many of you? Okay. So, um, so let me briefly explain. So. Let me make a personal example. So let's say I want to see what's the, do you guys, oh, you are a PhD student probably, so you don't take course. But let's say I want to know your average GPA of the students here, or like researchers here, okay? Um, your undergraduate GPA, okay? So one way is that I can ask each one of you, tell me your GPA, I use my calculator, and take the average, okay? Sum them up, divide it by the number, and have that. But the problem is that some of you may not want to tell me your undergraduate. And this is not a practical. A way to locally at least make a difference of pattern is that you can you can have your GPA in mind, but add a Gaussian noise. So let's say your GPA is 3.5. What's the GPA system in here? Out of six. Out of six? Okay. Well, 3.5 is good. So let's say you have GPA in 3.5. That's feasible. Okay. Let's say your GPA is 5.1. Is it? So, okay, 5.1. Your GPA is 5.1, and you want to tell it to me. I'm saying, no, don't tell it to me. Generate the Gaussian random points. Let's say you generate the Gaussian. Your Gaussian is minus one. You add it to your GPA, and you tell me that number, which is 4.1. This way, you just tell me after adding noise. I don't know the exact GPA of each one of you. But when I take the average of all, then the Gaussian, because of law of Wagner, they almost cancel each other. So I almost get an accurate. Estimate. This is an example of at least making things locally for each of you, differential part. I can use the same idea for make training neural networks. It's called DPSGD. So essentially, at each step of taking gradient, you can add Gaussian noise to it. Still makes the direction unbiased. Okay. It's not exact. So you can quantify this over all the interest. You can make sure that your algorithm, at the end of the day, your final solution that you are returning satisfies this with particular epsilon and delta. And epsilon and delta definitely depends on the variance of the noise that you add. The more noise you add, the more private your final. Yes? Yes, so why do you add the noise to the gradient and not to the data before? Oh, that's a very good point. So you can do differential privacy different ways. Okay, one is you can add it to your data, your x. So, Another way is that you can make add noise to your output, which is m of x. So you train the model, a neural network, for example. You add noise to the weights of the neural network at x. And the other one is that I do it during training, like what I said here. You can actually show that theoretically, um, you can show that empirically the one that you add to the gradient it works much better. OK? You can show actually theoretically that that's also the algorithm, for example, convex cases. You need to add to the, you can, you need to add to the gradient or there's another approach that I can add noise to the loss function, but this requires uh, some payment paying in computation. So in practice, the most, uh, the one that gives you the best trade-off because you don't want to run the algorithm too much. If I run the algorithm for a long time, although I have noise, but when you see something noisy multiple times, let's say I inquire your GPA 10,000 times and you add noise to it, but since I'm adding noise, I can take the average. I know you're exact. So I have to make sure that I'm not revisiting every data point also a lot, depending on the noise that I have. So, so because of that limitation, you typically pay when you want to have differential privacy. Your performance is not as good as the non-private model because the noise version. For example, in the example that I have, 
the, the average GPA that I'm estimating is not as good as the average GPA that I could have estimated by asking each of you exactly. So you pay and you can characterize this actually payment. So this is the algorithm, the same as before, you just add on the gradient descent and ascent. And actually what we did is we were able to do the first differential privacy analysis for mean max optimization to general mean max optimization. And what we showed is actually, this is I think by itself an interesting result that you can show that um, this is how much you lose because of adding privacy. So the more privacy you need, so epsilon is the prime privacy parameter. So epsilon smaller. So you can think of this as how far you are from the stationarity, okay? So you want the, you want this entire thing to be small. That means that you are getting to a good point. So for example, if you have a convex loss, gray making gradient small, it means that you are optimal. So this tells you that, uh, so this is the gap that you have from the case that you don't want privacy. And you, it's, you can see that if we need more privacy, it means that epsilon is smaller, then the gap is more. So if you need more privacy, you're losing more in terms of accuracy. And another thing is that you can see that if your n is large, which is the number of data points, then you're not losing that much. And that's also natural if you are familiar with differential privacy and it's intuitive. Intuitively, if I have one million people, removing or adding 1% should not change the opposite law. But if you're training a model based on five people's data, you just remove one of them and replace it with another person, that completely changes. These are very natural schemes. Um, you can tell that there are objectives as well toward our particular objective, although this analysis is general. Um, let me make a small comment that I don't believe that this is optimal rate, but a like theoretical optimal rate, but it gives you actually a trade off. So it's an optimal. So mm -hmm. still the optimal rate I, is, is open. It's open and it's not. So let me give you some. So I'm going to talk a little bit later how to add robustness to this. But before that, I want to show you some experiments. So you see that the things that I talked about, uh, you can see them also in practice of a new implement. So the first thing is that you can see that. So in this plot, we plotted the, let's say, the fairness violation or the test error. So the x-axis x axis is how much test error you get. And the y-axis is demographic price violation. So to the smaller, if you are to the lower left corner, it means that you have a better model. So lower, it means more fair. And to the left, it means that you have more accurate. So we want to be in this direction, okay? And how do I get this trade-off? Remember, in the algorithm that I have, I had a regular, right, lambda. And if there was a coefficient lambda in front of it, if I increase lambda, it means that I request, I require my model to have fairer performance by putting less emphasis on the accuracy. If I decrease lambda to zero, then I'm ignoring, for example, the fairness requirement. So by changing lambda value, you can essentially uh, traverse this trade-off, okay? Quantify this trade. So this is the plot that we get by changing lambda. This is our model, the lower left one, we compare it to some of the existing methods. And you can see that it gives you a good performance, not only in one demographic parity, but also in the other uh, fairness notions. One other thing is that I'm, so this is a basic experiment that we implemented everyone and compared it. It gives you a reasonable performance. It gives you good performance. Uh, the other thing that we implemented is this naive baseline. What is this naive baseline? This is an important baseline that I'm going to talk about. Like, uh, in the next slide. So this naive baseline, what I do is that I, with probability p, I'm randomly changing the output to be the majority class. Okay. The example that I had, uh, looking at this resume of the individuals and deciding whether I want to interview or not. Let's say you wanna not interview seventy five percent of them. Okay. The true label should be twenty five percent not interview. Okay. So. A completely fair model is that I always say that do not interview anyone, okay? That's a very fair model. Like the opposite is the same, whether you're female, male, whatever, ethnicity, uh, people. So by changing this, so I can look at my output, flipping a coin with probably P, I say I don't interview that. And by changing P, I can get this 
trailer. Okay. So this is a very nice baseline. I have the train model on her, but I make it fairer by changing this P. This is naive baseline, and you can see that it's worse than almost all existing algorithms in the literature. But what is interesting is that if you start decreasing the batch size, so here is 64, then we make it 16, then we make it four, and then we make this reduced batch size to one even, almost all the other existing algorithms, at least that one that we implemented, not all, collapse with the naive baseline, okay? And that's because they were not developed for stochastic when you have small batches, that's reasonable. The essential estimate, many of them, some of them at least, they estimate the fairness based on whether based on the batch of data. Okay. And you want to make sure that so if I estimate the entropy, let's say, or mutual information based on four samples, it's not an accurate estimation and it is biased if you don't do it properly. So you want to make sure that, that in the long term, long run is at least unbiased. You can also implement it on other tasks, more complex tasks, for example, here is for YouTube uh, comments, whether they are, uh, you want to decide whether they are offensive or not, okay? You want to make sure that they are fair against different uh, religions, okay? Whether they're toxic or not. Uh, and as the bad size decreases, again, we saw the same thing. So this, actually, this was, this is a very good and nice paper, uh, like it, the, Post et al. that they as they did the maximum correlation size. Uh, or actually they did do MMB type regularization, not maximum correlation, MMB type regularization. But it turns out that if you do proper stochastic optimization, you can get, you cannot reasonably get a good performance also when you decrease the stresses. And you can make it private as well. So as I said, you just add more. But this is for the one that we implemented this scenario. And, and this is the this is the non-private version. So this is the non-private version. It's the same for all plots. So we start from small epsilon, means that meaning that we need a lot of privacy, start relaxing epsilon and make it less private. So this one is less private than the first one. And you can see that this orange line. It's getting closer and closer to the green line. It means that as you increase epsilon, as you say that privacy doesn't matter for me, then the performance of the algorithm they are colliding, which is what we are expecting. And it's better than some of the non-gradient based methods that exist in the literature. Uh, another observation that I mentioned is that uh, if you have more and larger number of data sets, then this is actually for a larger n. I don't have the n sample. You can see that these are colliding with each other. So you can get actual privacy for almost three. So that is for free, but it's at least empirically the private version and non-private version can perform similarly when you have a large number of samples, which is meaning, which is what we expect. How much time do I have? We go for... okay five in five minutes okay so let me quickly tell you that you can add also robustness on top of this so I would love to see your actual paper because you are interested in solving this problems like this uh, if I see your paper I mean... so essentially you want to minimize the loss you may have some uncertainty or you may not have even if you don't have uncertainty or you don't want to care about your accuracy a lot, do not robustify it, that's fine. But you want to make sure that you satisfy your fairness requirement, even in your input distribution. And this is important, it, it happens in practice. There, is, there are papers that, for example, show that the models that they train based on the data of one hospital, and they were fair. When they went and deployed in another hospital data, they become unfair. And that makes sense because your distribution or demographics of the people that you're trying your algorithm on, it changes. So the distribution changes. So the fairness requirements depends on the distribution. And when the distribution changes, you don't have also fairness. Your fairness might not be as good as what you're expecting. So you are, we are helping to solve problems like this. Any questions about this? 
And there are also other works that they try to do it for particular cases uh, of it. For example, logistic regression is this work that they did for the great work that they did for logistic regression, not stochastic, but it's a great work. Uh, so it's not easy even for logistic regression case uh, and non stochastic regression. This work is also a great work, but they did the proxy. So they did some. Uh, so, the, so essentially, they did. They, they observed that fairness is related to sharpness of your minimization. So, they connect. They use some sharpness proxy instead of actual fairness. Which, yes, yes. So, ideally, we want to do this, but I can still regularize it because I don't know how to handle it. I do regularize it. I do this. Okay, and for simplicity, let's say that I only care about my fairness to be. Robust. Okay. I don't care about if I lose my performance, my loss a lot. Although you can bring this max, you know, max for the performance as well. You can bring it about, but uh, and we have theory, but uh, because there exists a theory for how to make minimization of the loss robust, I want to see how fairness violation measures, how do we can make them robust. And it turns out that you can quantify that loss, okay? You can actually get almost, you can get close form for different choices of U2. So for different, for example, balls that you consider um, the training data, the maximum, it's actually itself is an added regularization. So in order to make things robust, you need to have another regularization. And for example, the interesting thing is that this is the regularization that we use, okay, Fermi. This is another regularization that some other works use. It turns out that if you combine the two regularizations, this is somehow a VRO, uh, robust regularization for this stuff. So if you add another, which this is maximum correlation, this chi-square divergence, if you add maximum correlation divert to, to the chi-square divergence, that makes the chi-square divergence robust. Okay. Uh, and we have some algorithms, stochastic algorithms to make it, okay, again, with min max, we have some algorithms for making it robust. And you can also bring the robustness to the first part with known tricks such as CVAR or group DRO. So let me show you some experiments and I'll be done. Any questions about this part? So we're moving to the experiment. So essentially the trick, if I want to tell you high level, is that the trick is that you can analyze this. You can get almost close form. For different uncertainties that you can get almost closed form and use that closed form. That closed form again gives you some losses that they are nonlinear in the probability domain, but you can use variational form, write it as a max of another function or use uh, differential dual uh, realization. Different. So, and then use similar ideas. Is this high level here? Yeah. Okay. So, this is a very uh, busy image. But what is happening is that we are trying to predict, let's say some ACS income data. We want to predict the income of the individuals, whether they're low income or high, inco high income. And we have the data of 52 states. So you want to make sure that your model is fair, meaning that you want to make sure that, and we have fair, four groups of sensitive. You want to make sure that, if you want to decide, for example, whether the people are credit worthy or not, you want to make sure that you're treating white male, white female, black male, and black female similar, okay? So what we do is we train based on the data of one state. This is a census data, US census data, and try it in another state. Okay, this is a natural distribution shift. So the status that gives you a natural distribution shift. That's uh, proposed in this actual work. This is a very nice one. So, and we plot the accuracy and fairness. So again, to the lower left, Actually, this is a little bit different. Accuracy, the higher, the upper left is good. So top left is good and bottom right is not good, it's bad. So what happens is that first of all, you can see that this is the, when we don't robustify anything, this black. So we train on, so we, we train on the data of Utah for one state and we test it on all other people. So we get like 51 other points 
which is like all of us. We cannot plot all of them. What we do is that we consider the 25 percent and 75 percent and plot this uh, cross. Okay, that tells you that you are almost your outputs are within this box almost. This is the non-robust version, but when you impose robustness on fairness, the, talk, the thing that we talk, gives you this one. And you can see that this shrinked a lot. So we get almost fair everywhere. But we haven't, like in this one, we haven't yet imposed robustness on the accuracy. You can impose robustness on accuracy as well, and that gives you this, this one, this gray one which is higher actually, and the changes are small. And you repeat repeated for all other different states. So, and uh, we compare it with some other models that they are developed for non-robust pair. And as you can see, they are not robust because they haven't developed for that purpose. So let me summarize. Uh, so we saw fairness requirements and how we should make sure that uh, at least if we want to have an algorithm that we can, we want to implement it for larger models, we want to make sure that it's stochastic optimization standard. And that helps us also to bring privacy in the picture. And with some changes and some uh, adjustments to the algorithm, we can make it distribution robust. Uh, and these are the papers that I talked about. So. First one is like regular fairness that I talked about the first two. Then you can make it differential private. So that's like the third one that can make it robust. And I want to thank the, also the agencies who supported this work. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Questions? And thank you all for coming. I know many of you have been my <laughs> Thank you. So you, you mentioned this yes. in, so you mentioned online, offline, and in line. Oh, in processing, pre-processing, post-processing. Pre post yes. yes. yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. So um, how do you, how do you see this within this broader tapestry of approaches in the sense that, you know, like, is it complementary to for example, I know for things like equalize a lot of people do calibration of neural network bridges, yes. for example. That yeah. helps a lot. That helps a lot, yes. Um, so have you actually looked into how these things combine in such a way? We didn't look at combine, but we compare them. In some of these experiments that we I saw, like we also include the post-processing. I don't think we have in pre-processing, but uh, this like, in these post Calibration in the end. Yes. What I've seen for fairness, they, they help a lot. I think this is a far, it's yeah, all it's it's post, so far, so yes. Okay, yes. This is post processing, I think. Yeah. Still, it turns out that if you want to train one model and you are willing to spend a lot of computational power, you can gain by in processing. And that makes sense because it is like you're relaxing. At the same time, you should we are losing in computation. So you are, and you are losing because if you have, a, for example, an LLM or a model that's already trained, if you want to do in processing, that might be really not possible because you already have a trained model. It's very costly. And post processing is are much easier. Yeah. If, yeah. So that's, that's the loss. Yeah, that's Other a very good point. Other questions? Question oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes. So any so essentially the VR open version of here. So we are talking about robust Fermi or Fermi itself. Fermi itself. So Fermi itself that's not VR, but it's robust min max optimization. And any min max optimization, min max optimizations are special cases of high level because there is like the inner optimization and outer optimization. So, yes, but it is a little bit easier in terms of solving. So, you don't want to go for the general tools for high level. I don't think that using the general tools for high level is a good idea unless you use again from compare, come back to the same. The fact that it's a zero. So, but that's a very good question. You can use it, 
But the special case, so let's focus on this special case and try to make it best for this special case. Very good point. Any other questions? Yes. Is there any way to you actually have also a generalized analysis like that included? But it's typical one over square through n time. So if you can transfer to yeah, you can transfer. As long as you assume you have IAD. If you don't now have IAD, then you need to use the meaning that IAD means that I'm assuming that your data is IAD. The train and test states are half the same. They don't have, then you need to look at the last paper, which is the RO framework. So then you realize the simplification is significant because the summation is inside the So you're smoothing the overall objective. Ah, uh, but then did I, add, I, I understand this question correctly then? So you're asking whether I do a full batch or a small batch? Mm -hmm. But normally, the problem is you would like to solve is like to the power of there, it's probably one over there. What's the expectation? Okay. Then in practice, like, uh, if you solve it with them, I ah. give you examples. Okay. How does it transfer to the general population there? Uh, yes. So, so, okay. So, if you replace the expectation, we have uh, like a result connecting the two, a gradient norm connecting the gradient norms, bounding them. As uh, Volkan said, but you have to work with the smoothness thing because that in general may not be smooth or well in this case. You have that law constant because of strong concavity assumption. And we assume that our loss, actually, our analysis assumes the loss is also smooth. So F is smooth. We assume it's Although you may have that's a typical assumption, but you have rarely used another thing. So. Thank you all again for coming. Oh, no, thank you for coming.